Hello and welcome back. I'm Sean and this is the Mountains Garage YouTube channel where today we're going to start the assembly process of my personal power glide transmission for my fast street car, sometimes race car, single turbo LS swapped 64 Dodge Dart GT that fell into my lap and I'm trying to make a cheap fun car. Cheap is relevant like I said yesterday. Today, I've got the transmission mocked up so I can check the end play. Don't panic, it has to come back apart and we'll cover how to put each piece in the case. I want to convert to a Baron, a Torrington Baron on the back side of the pump to replace the factory thrust washer. There's two options if you're shopping for power glide parts, a thick or a thin Baron. A lot of times, this is the thin version, it can be a drop-in. This bearing, I believe, is out of a 5R55 Ford transmission that somebody was smart enough to look at it and say, hey, that might fit the back of a power glide pump. And here we are. So I mocked up the transmission with my stock thrust washer, oh, a stock thrust washer that I had, set up the dial indicator, and I'm at 12 thousandths, which is perfect for a Torrington Baron in this situation. If I was using the factory thrust washer, you'd probably want 28 to 50 thousandths. More than the Baron. You don't want that much with a Baron, so this is going to be easy math for me. I'm happy with the end play with the thrust washer. I measure it. I measure the new Baron. I cut the like amount off the back side of the pump, and I should nail it first try. This is my mock-up, the back half of the pump attached with a couple bolts, provides an excellent flat spot for the magnet to attach for the dial indicator. And to check the end play, I steady the case with one arm and just push up and down on the output shaft, and that's direct reading on the input shaft because they touch in the middle. So just up and down with the output shaft shows me my end play on the input shaft. This was my setup. I set the dial indicator up and cut 30 off the surface on the back of the pump. All machined and mocked up again. The casting when you machine it is more of a powder so it's not real clingy and it's easy to clean. I had taped off all the passages that head into the stator tube where things could get caught in there and I flushed it out with brake clean and blew it out several times. So I'm confident it's nice and clean. Now we're back together, zeroed. There's no pump gasket in here. And I'm now at 10 thousandths. That's on the tighter side. It's perfect. 10 to 15 is what you want with a Baron. The gasket's going to add a few thousandths. So let's check it out. Simple as that. On to the next step. Finally, it's time for assembly. I had mentioned in a previous video, through a third-party seller, I had found a deal on a 198 BTE lower gear set. That deal did not pan out. I did get a refund. And then I did the smart thing. I picked up the phone, called BTE Direct, much like I had before. They already know my name. They know what I bought a few months ago. I ordered this 180 gear set. I decided to change ratios at the last second. So it's a 1.80. I ordered it on a, last Wednesday. It was at my house on Friday. No messing around. It was $95 more than the mysterious deal that wasn't real. So that's the way it goes sometimes when you try to save a few bucks and you're shopping at midnight. For assembly, step one, there's a roller bearing on the output of all power glides. You either transfer it from your old gear set or buy a new one and grease it and stick it on there or you can set it in the case whatever suits your fancy I had this stuck on there and when I just pulled it apart after mock-up it stayed there so I'm cool with that the reverse ring gear I simply wiggled it down through the clutches until it's down all the way you can tell lube the case bushing now I'm gonna lower the gear set into place it's easy you start it down through from the top and then you can reach underneath 
and guide it all the way down in. Just like that, there's another Torrington Baron that sits right here. You either have to get a new one, they're about 30 bucks. On your 176 gear set, this will be loose and you can remove it just like this. This pulls in and out no problem. On the 182 gear set, you have to take the retainer out, slide a couple pins out, move these gears out of the way to get the Baron out. But either way, source yourself a Baron. It has a solid hat on top, so you can't see the Torringtons. On the opposite side, you can see the Barons. It's only, if you're used to seeing three pieces like on the Turbo 400, this only has two. It's all one piece, it doesn't fall apart. But if I flip this over, you can see the Torrington. That's normal. So plenty of lube, stick it in there. Lube the thrust washer you can see down there at the end of the gear set. Over here, I much debate. I went back and forth between which shaft to use. I decided to stick with the BTE. If it doesn't lube their gear set, well, I'll be upset. I lubed the one ring this does have. I lubed up the wedding band and slid it in to the sun gear. With the assembly goo, it'll all stay together and I can lower this in on top of the lower gear unit. I lowered the high clutch drum and input shaft into position. You know you're down. When the input shaft feels solid, you have to make sure this goes all the way into the thrust washer in the lower gear unit. I have set my thrust bearing that'll be behind between the pump and the high gear clutch drum already in position. I was lucky to have the original band in perfect shape. If you have an OEM band, it has asbestos in it. It's a great piece, other than the, you know, health hazards. Nothing has replaced asbestos in bands with the same performance level. Kevlar is pretty good. There's a few other choices. However, if you have an OEM band in good shape, it's gold. The band strut coming out of the servo goes up to the servo, down to the band, just like that. The Adjuster side, doesn't matter. Sometimes you can see the number, sometimes you can't. I just ran the adjuster in so it's snug, so it's not putting any force on the drum. This all slides in after you put the high clutch drum in. Plenty of room, just lower it down. Don't drop the band strut or that piece, so you have to fish it back out. I've gone ahead, put my pump gasket in the opening. This is ready for the pump. The pump I assembled with a band when I tightened the bolts to make sure it's square. I put the outer seal on and lubed it. I put the high gear clutch Teflon rings. Don't, do not run cast rings anywhere on the input shaft or the pump. These rings seal the high gear clutch oil. The drum slides over this. High gear clutch oil comes out of the valve body through this passage through the pump gasket, through the pump, and the rings make it apply. You can see the apply hole in the high clutch drum. There's a ring on either side of it to seal it in. Because I am installing a bell housing before I lowered the pump completely into place, I wanted to make sure I had a bolt representative in every hole so it's perfectly aligned. Because I've mocked it up, there's no drama assembling this. I double check my end play. And while you're here, before you go ahead and make the bell housing installation final, air up the high clutch hole and make sure you can hear it applying. Now it's time for the bell housing. I bought this used, it's brand new but has never been installed. I did not have any hardware kit, nor would I use most of it. Thinking ahead, this is going to be my locking dipstick. It needs to go in the one bolt hole the LS engine does not have. So like I've done so many times before in this channel, I just take the M10 one and a half helicoil tap, run it seven eighths of the way down, not all the way through. Put the insert in, break the tang off, and now I have a useful hole. The bolt that I use is from an LS truck motor mount. 
the little short ones that go into the block. I got bushel baskets of them. So I shine it up. It's nice and short and stout. It'll do a good job mounting the dipstick. Otherwise, you have nothing to hook it to. I will check the proper dipstick level when we get there. I do know the correct bolt length is 5 16 18 by 2 and a quarter, grade 8, which I've grabbed seven of them. I've been using for a ceiling washer on the aftermarket Bellhausens. These that I bought from McMaster Car, I got $7 for 100. I bought two packages. I actually have to use the impact slowly and wind them down on the threads and the rubber seals the shank of the bolt wonderfully tight. These are not flange bolts, so I've added an AN washer to back up the ceiling washer. If this was a flange bolt, I would just put the silver washer on directly. This has been working fantastic. I don't need to use RV, excuse me, RTV, <laughs> RV. RTV, which you know I don't like, but I don't like leaks either. Actual Bellhausen installation, I don't use the O-rings that would go between the Bellhausen and the pump. I use the ATI gasket. Same thing I use on the Turbo 400, except a different part number. This is the part number for the Power Glide. I put it on my painted pump, and probably over time when the paint heats up, it's just going to seal even better. I just drop it on dry, put one drop of Loctite on each of the bolts, and bolt it up dry. No leaks, no RTV. No worries. The bell housing is on. That works fantastic. I've mocked up my dipstick. I just have it clamped to the bell housing. The correct fluid level in a power glide should be three quarters of an inch up from the pan rail. And I've actually prick punched it way up here where it should be. You can see where they marked the hot fall. They missed it by that much. So I'll know what the prick punch means. Unfortunately, if anybody else had to read it, they'd probably get it wrong. I wish they'd just done it right to start with. I'll probably make a more distinct mark and take my electric engraver and write a new full mark on it so future generations will know. This is the box and the pot number of the dipstick. So if you have one of these, chances are your transmission is not full. I grabbed a hold of the transmission because it's not heavy, it's just a power glide and set it on its back on the bench. In another video, I almost cut off the Olds Buick Pontiac Cadillac ears on the Universal Bellhausen. And now I'm glad I left them because it actually helps out on the bench. It makes a nice fixture, that and a high-tech block of wood and some paper towel so I don't scratch my paint. We're in service position from underneath. Step one, in this position is to adjust the band. We had only snugged it before. So using a, I believe it's a 730 seconds Allen wrench, an 11 sixteenths wrench, you gotta run the band adjuster in until it's tight and stop, stops moving. Now there's an actual torque figure for that. Use your head. You don't want it, you know, not tight and fully collapsed so you can measure backing the screw out. But you don't want to snap it off either so just go wrist tight you're probably good and then i back it out three and a half turns there's adjustments listed from three to four turns four turns used to be the norm i think i'm happier at three and a half so i backed it out three and a half just counting half turns with my allen wrench held it still tighten the nut that's all there is to that get yourself the blow gun See if I can do this holding the camera, swapping hands. I'll sing you a song while I do this and apply it. Oops. That's my air gun jumping out of my hand. Works nice. Now it's time to talk about my trans brake valve body. I bought this about a month ago, and the night I was shopping for trans brakes, they were either all over 500. I was shopping in the $400-ish range, and there wasn't any. And most wouldn't be back in stock until January. I had checked my usual contacts, but again, it was late at night. 
I wanted to get this project rolling. I made what I feel a poor choice and bought this one on eBay. It was 380 something dollars, not bad. Claims to be a pro break. You do have to push the button to back up. I'm okay with that. It showed up in a reasonable amount of time. The instruction sheet, I have a habit of going on and finding all the instruction sheets for most all valve bodies. And the instruction sheets are either, either this is an FDI valve body that's been repackaged, or they stole the instructions word for word, picture for picture, warning for warning from the FDI website. That is a question I didn't ask when I called. <coughs> Excuse me. When I did ask, I called and asked one te tech question because there's a number on the instruction sheet. There's a number right on the solenoid. I'll show you the solenoid. I won't name them by name. It's a nice looking solenoid. I mean, somebody put some work into it. I like the big trash can style. Appears to be new-ish. <laughs> So I called them up. The only question I wanted to know, uh, backing up for a second, in a power glide, you don't check actual line pressure. There is no port for that. However, you can check low gear. That's going to give you an idea. And you can check reverse right there. And in some models, you could check high. There was a port over here in their later years. And it's widely known that between 180 and 220 PSI is what you want. On a stock case power glide, they're kind of weak in the rear piston area. In fact, you should be cautioned if the transmission was extremely cold and you apply the trans brake. They claim that leads to cracking under the piston. But either way, for clutch longevity, we spoke about this before, it's all about hydraulic pressure. And you want, I wanted something around 180. But I wanted to know what the valve body had in it because... Unlike a Turbo 400 where the pressure regulator spring is in the pump on a power glide, it's right there in the valve body. So I called the 800 number a few times, finally got a voice. He sounded like Evil Knievel. <laughs> and I was told, and I had to ask, I asked two or three times to make sure we were talking, it led to an argument almost. I was told this. Trans brake is set for 40 pounds. 40 pounds. Doesn't seem likely. I was also told that in his personal dragster, he ran 400 pounds. But 180 to 220 was not correct. I was wrong. There was no name calling, but let's just say that conversation was over. All I wanted to know is what it was set for. So I had a good idea. Now, using my calibrated finger, I can push in on that. I can tell you it's a pretty stiff spring. I have a 180 and a 220 spring. I could just change it, but out of curiosity, I'm not going to. I'm gonna install it and I'm gonna check it with a pressure gauge anyway. Worst case scenario, I gotta pop the pan back down. I have a reusable gasket and I'll change the spring, but I was gonna change the spring first and then I thought, well, you know what? I really want to know what it was set for. Because all I wanted was the correct answer. Further inspection. I mean, it came rusty just like this. No big deal. I can abate that. The manual valve, I actually recently, minutes ago, broke it loose with a rubber hammer first because it was rusted in place. And I've cleaned the bore out and I got it working fine. It is spring release because that has a spring behind it. It came just like this. It wasn't in a bag. It wasn't sealed up. I'm spoiled by, for instance, automatic transmission design. That thing comes, it could survive a, an explosion. It is unbelievable packaging. It's perfectly safe. It's everything you'd expect. This was thrown in this bag right here, just like this. I haven't touched it. I haven't altered it to make it look worse. That's what I got. The gasket is horribly misaligned, so I'm going to Loosen all the bolts and try to straighten that out. It came wrinkled a little bit. I have buyer's remorse. But I'm going to press on. I own it. I could probably send it back. But at this point, I'm just going to put it in. I loosened all the bolts. 
and separated the halves. Realigned the gasket. I just put bolts down through this way to align the gasket while you tighten the bolts from the bottom, technically. When I noticed that the casting is actually broken there, but this upper part of the valve body is not doing anything anymore. And I also noticed that one of the attaching bolts should look like that. You know, it's fully surround the bolt. This is broken, rusted. It's been like that for a while. So I'll use a flange head bolt or whatever to make sure it's clamping over here. But at this point, any sane person would lose their mind and send it back. Me, I'll just press on. Did you know in a power glide you could buy kits to make your own? It's half of what a valve body is. I'm going to try that someday. Valve body's installed. You kind of have to tilt it down into the case while you have your finger on the trans brake valve, formerly the modulator valve. You got to kind of work it in this way and align the manual valve over here. You can't use studs while you're doing it due to the angle you're coming at it with the valve body. I like to use contrasting bolts. That way it's obvious when you go to remove the valve body what you have to remove. This plate centers the linkage so it doesn't fall off the manual valve. And you have to, I did anyway, transfer this rocker. There's an E-clip that holds it on and there's a spring here that keeps tension on the rooster. I've been dry firing the valve to make sure it works. It works fine. No issues there. Next is the deep pan. It is a, sorry about getting, making you sick with the camera. It came with Steph's instructions. Steph's makes high quality fabricated pans. I didn't know they dealt with, you know, this style pan, but hey, it's got a magnet stuck in it. It's a nice quality pan. It's the first power glide piece I bought only a month and a half ago or so from my buddy Ken. My enabler buddy who was selling me all kinds of parts. I bought a power glide pan and said, hey, might as well build a power glide. Making you sick again with the camera. So you have to run a filter extension with a deep pan. Just use a couple stock gaskets. Normally there'd just be a gasket there and two small screws, quarter inch. Now you sandwich that in the middle. This is an FDI filter, but there's nothing special about it. All the stock power glide filters were a nice mesh. I just opened an O'Reilly one that I had in a package. Same thing, if not a little better looking. I don't like the conversions that use a Mopar Dacron style filter, the yellow one. It's open on both sides and when you study pan removal on any video online but it has one of those Mopar filters in it, the side facing the pan where all the stuff lays in the pan is just sucked right against the filter. So it's probably only sucking from the top, which is what the factory design, design does. This sits in the pan. The metal section is down against the pan bottom, and the fluid enters the top. So you avoid that level of mung that collects on the bottom of the pan. That's just my opinion, but I'll stick with this. And, you know, depending on who you ask, you know, up to a three-second, eighth-mile car, that stock power glide filter will do the job. I went back to my bin of AN washes and put a couple under the quarter inch bolts because race car, that's what it looks like for the extension. Now I'm gonna set the pan on with a few bolts. It's about time I look at the instructions for the transmission shield that goes over the body of the transmission to see how that attaches because that'll play in, I'm sure, to my selection of pan bolts. Thinking ahead the other night, I already had 5 16 18 socket head screws in three quarter inch length. I bought one inch and one and a quarter, knowing I was bolting things onto this pan and I didn't have any hardware that I liked. So it worked out today. I had to use the inch all except in all except four places and then the overflow tank and the bracket for the quarter stick. I had to use an inch and a quarter. I'm curious whether this ear needs to come off or whether the cable will clear. I'll have to research that in the instructions. And I used an AN washer, 5 16ths on each one. Going with today's theme, because race car. Now I need to flip it over on the pan. We'll finish up the tail housing. And I read the instructions. 
for the transmission shield and it does not attach to the pan bolts. Fortunately, it attaches to the tail housing bolts and the servo cover. So over we go. And for the record, I had to grind a bevel on the back side of the bracket to clear this radius of the pan. Pretty typical with a thick aluminum pan. They're nice, but most brackets don't fit. You have to modify. All right, she's rolled over and we can work on the tail housing, but I want to stop right here and tell you how disappointed I am in you. How come nobody hollered when I was putting the valve body on that you forgot the tube that connects the valve body underneath the servo in the pan? So when I finish up here, I get to roll it back over, pop the pan off. Fortunately, it's a reusable gasket and lower the valve body, put this in. Stupid. I'm only human. And I'm not afraid to show my mistakes. But for now, we're going to continue forward. On the back of the transmission, if you remember, this was my old reverse apply hole that I plugged with a set screw. This is my new reverse apply hole. Back here is the governor support. It supports the output shaft. It used to, it's called the governor support because the governor fit into the back of it. Obviously, we no longer have a governor because we're manual shift. So this is a non-pump governor support. And it will block off the back, this hole right here, which is our goal. Regardless of what we bolt on the back, we need to plug that reverse feed hole or all the oil is going to come out in the tail housing and not apply the piston. So whatever combination of parts you want to use, there's nothing wrong with the non-rear pump governor support with the correct gasket that will block it off. You want to run the pump style rear support, you can buy this plate and gasket and that's going to block it off. Then you can put the pump style governor support over it. You could run this plate with the late one if you want to, just to be doubly sure even though that does block it off. It seems like overkill. In my case I bought this Sonex, you can read the number. It's a roller bearing support and it comes with the regular gasket. But it blocks off everything. That oval hole is the drain hole. It sits in the bottom of the tail housing. And there's actually a little baffle that would go just like that when you bolt it in. It keeps oil from splashing down in there, I guess. It's there, I'll put it back. So we're gonna bolt this on. I'm gonna lube this up. It is roller. I could have rollerized the back of the case, but. You can combine the two, you can run both roller, you can run both bushing style. I don't think it really matters. Most of the rotational drag is the clutches. So the dipstick's mounted, overflow tank is plumbed. I installed the rear governor support on my new billet roller support. These are the factory bolts. Again, I dipped into the AN washer bucket, to, you know, because race car. That's the baffle. The only thing that seals the tail housing is this quad ring I've already put over the governor support. It sits right in the groove. Now five bolts, we put the tail housing on. Tail housing on, shield is on. I remember power glide shields being a lot easier and they are. They attach here and here on the tail housing. Two bolts into the servo cover so it hides most of my purple servo. And there's one long twisty one, they call it. I have to actually drill and tap for a hole right there. And the undershield, you have to mark what depth you want and you make your own hole. You can either drill and tap it or drill right through the shield. That's what the instructions say to do. I like the date on the shield doesn't start until February. So that much longer before it's, you know, magically turns to junk overnight. Whew, if it wasn't for my stuff up, as my uh, Australian friends are going to tell me, where I got to pull the pan back off, but I need to flip it over to drill and tap that one small hole for the bracket anyway, so no big deal. If you think I'm not going to be hot on myself, well, you're probably wrong. I will be. We have semi-adequate clearance for the cool lines and stuff, so the dipstick would come in and out. It's compact, should fit in the car. Okay, that does it for this assembly series. Next, it's gonna 
be fit in the car and we'll try stuffing an engine in there to see how that goes. So this video got a little bit long, so I'm going to cut it short. Like, share, subscribe. Thanks for watching. See you in a couple days.